So blue carbon is a term that's used to describe the very large carbon deposits that are associated with mangroves and seagrasses and marshes, salt marshes. So these carbon deposits per hectare are often, you know, four times that in terrestrial systems. They sequester carbon at about 10 times the rate on an area basis, right? So these are, um, and this, this, this occurs, these sort of large stocks accumulate because these are terrestrial plants that have nasty sort of like very carbon rich compounds like lignin that have through a master stroke of innovation and evolution managed to invade the intertidal zone. <laughs> so they bring with them lignin and cellulose into waterlogged so anoxic saline sediments. And what that means is that the, the, the carbon decomposes extremely slowly, yeah? The white rot fungi that are responsible for decomposing carbon in the terrestrial environment hasn't managed to follow them into the intertidal. So in addition to that, these sediments accrete over time. So they add millimetres of sediment uh, each year, often at about the same rate as sea level rise. So through the Holocene, we've had the building of deposits of peat in the Caribbean, for example, of about 10 metres below these mangrove islands. And a similar sort of thing can be observed in the seagrasses of the Mediterranean and, in fact, in parts of uh, Australia as well. So we have these very specialised suite of characteristics lots of below ground production that doesn't decompose, lots of roots and structure that trap sediments that lead to these very large carbon deposits. So that's, that's the sort of what the material part of blue carbon means. It's the high levels of organic carbon sequestered in soils. But blue carbon also outlines a range of strategies for conservation and restoration of coastal wetlands. Right? So it's used in both ways and it's, it's aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions by avoiding the destruction of these systems globally and also by restoring them. Right? So we're basically using this blue carbon service the capacity to mitigate CO2 emissions into the atmosphere, um, to stimulate conservation and restoration that conserves other ecosystem services that we're really interested in. So why this occurred, why this developed, is because basically the coastal wetlands of the world have been, you know, like converted, degraded, destroyed, right? So we have, you know, these are a couple of top, a uh, couple of... Um, of my favourite papers that outline the, the really dismal story about coastal wetlands. Mangroves, they're one of the world's most threatened tropical environment. In fact, 30 to 50% have been removed globally, mainly due to um, conversion to shrimp farming. There's accelerating loss of seagrasses due to low water quality. And of course, the salt marshes, I think the Romans started to do a really good job on converting them, right? That's been going on for centuries. So we care because of this whole raft of ecosystem services that these systems provide. So, you know, this is a report that came out um, relatively recently that sort of outlined all the great things that uh, mangroves do for, uh, mangroves and other blue carbon systems do, to, do for coastal communities. You can see climate regulation. That's the one that I'm talking about today. But really, it's not only about that. It's all about all the other ecosystem services. And for local communities, that often means fish, coastal protection, timber and other products, and also uh, so, uh, recreational. And then you can't forget the sort of, uh, particularly when you're talking about Indigenous communities, they have um, s spiritual and cultural values that are associated with these uh, ecosystems. So this, because of the, this is such a, um, a winning package, you know, we're doing climate change mitigation and we're preserving ecosystem services when we take on blue carbon, it's been met with global enthusiasm. And in fact, this is uh, uh, the President of uh, Republic of Indonesia who first said at one of the UN summits that his country was interested in blue carbon in, as a, a means to mitigate uh, climate change, right? So... Um, it's not only Indonesia. Well, Indonesia has a lot of blue carbon resources as well. They're 
They have the largest mangrove cover in the world uh, and also important for seagrasses. But it's not only um, Indonesia, Australia has also been incredibly enthusiastic. And in fact, it's the Australian government's initiative uh, forming the International Partnership for Blue Carbon. And you can see everybody standing here in uh, Marrakesh. So this is, um, you know, Australia's enthusiasm and trying to help other nations to uh, adopt uh, blue carbon uh, strategies. Okay, so this enthusiasm hasn't just been all talk and people standing around for uh, photo opportunities. There has been some other really tangible um, uh, progress in this field. So the first thing I wanted to point out was this rather horrible looking IPCC document, which was published in 2014. So this document's important for a number of reasons. It is the guidance for countries on how to account for both the destruction and restoration of coastal ecosystems, All right? So this is, you know, this is important because it says there is sufficient science to say that when you cut down a mangrove and turn it into a shrimp pond, it equals so many carbon dioxide emissions to that atmosphere. And when you restore them, then you can basically count that as a part of your emission reductions and towards your emission reductions targets, right? So this is very high level. It gives instructions to countries who are signed on, right, to IPCC. So there's that document and there's a, another piece that's coming with the 2019 revision of the greenhouse gas guidelines that is to do, that will also help us out, which is about aquaculture. But um, in addition to this sort of governmental or intergovernmental guidance, there's also been quite a lot of activity in the voluntary markets. So this is all about trying to stimulate finance for conservation and restoration. So we have uh, the American Carbon Registry had a very early methodology for restoration of mangroves in the Mississippi. And then we have the Verified Carbon Standard, which has a, a lovely methodology for restoring uh, coastal wetlands, but also has just added a new piece, which is for conservation, which is a similar to uh, Red Plus, if you know about um, that methodology. And then finally, our own um, market, the uh, Emission Reduction Fund, uh, scoped uh, a methodology for blue carbon in 2017. So we actually have quite a lot of um, activity uh, towards um, making restoration and conservation uh, financially viable, but also uh, of interest to nations. So in Australia, we're pretty lucky. We had a, um, a, a, a sort of a big, big investment by CSIRO. It was called the... Uh, well, for short, we called it the carbon cluster, but it was called, you know, the biogeochemistry of carbon. Whatever. But it actually um, skilled up a lot of us and it underpinned this uh, emission reduction fund uh, scoping document. We were, um, you can see a paper here, we were, we were focused, uh, as a lot of blue carbon work is, internationally, uh, because the loss of mangroves is happening at an alarming rate in countries like... Myanmar, uh, Cambodia, and Malaysia, right? But um, it did also sort of underpin uh, and allowed us to be poised for what might come next. And um, so this is where I want to talk about how blue carbon can be useful for the Great Barrier Reef. So for the Great Barrier Reef, we really, you know, are interested in a number of uh, things. And I'll only just put a few here that blue carbon and the restoration of coastal ecosystems might help the reef uh, through global climate regulation, right? So trying to reduce our emissions and it will, in the process, meet our national obligations. Uh, mangroves or restoring the mangroves and other coastal wetlands of the GBR will definitely be important for fish. Um, and we've got this happy camper who's catching fish with a mangrove. Actually, if you, if you Google, you know, uh, if you just look at photos of fish from the Great Barrier Reef, you often see a mangrove in the background or some kind of uh, coastal wetland. 
And then finally, it is going to help us with uh, water quality. Now, that's because coastal wetlands have a very high capacity for denitrification. So dissolved inorganic nitrogen can be released to the atmosphere as nitrogen. They also are important for sed sediment trapping and then, of course, the burial of nitrogen and phosphorus in those accreting sediments and also in the biomass. We have to be a bit realistic about this. I don't really want to give the impression that restoring the coastal wetlands of the Great Barrier Reef is going to solve all our issues. And that is because, basically, the loads have increased sixfold, yet the reduction in freshwater wetlands is about half the coverage pre-European settlement, and that of the coastal wetlands or the salty wetlands have been reduced only overall by about 15%. OK, but what are our opportunities for blue carbon in the GBR? Um, we have a number of opportunities, and I've put two here in the big pictures, which is the first one is, of course, the ponded pastures. Now, I don't know whether everybody... And this is this photograph uh, to the... here. So what happens with this land use is there's a pondage bank built to basically hold back the tide and then the land is flooded from the, from the landward side with fresh water in order to uh, keep the landscape wet for cattle production into the dry season. So this is particularly important land use um, in the Mackay, Whitsunday region, also the Burdigan. So what happens here in this freshwater land is that there are pasture weeds. And of course, it's freshwater, so they are emitting methane, a very powerful greenhouse gas. Right? And there's not much carbon sequestration. But if you contrast that with the uh, coastal salty wetlands, the methane emissions from these sorts of wetlands, because they're salty, is very low. And we have high levels of carbon sequestration. So actually turning back a lot of these uh, kinds of land uses can help us uh, because, of course, then it allows fish to traverse the fresh to salty boundary, but it also reduces our methane emissions. The second example I've got for you here is uh, sugarcane, which you can see, 2005, to some kind of tidal breach where it's been uh, lost through to 2008. Now, this is actually really quite common uh, if you start uh, zooming around and Google Earth, you can see this sort of thing in lots of places. And it, what it indicates is that there is scope for the restoration of uh, wetlands in the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon. And this kind of thing actually could be uh, very common throughout the uh, wet tropics. But we go from a sugarcane field, which is emitting nitrous oxide, an extremely powerful greenhouse gas, to uh, a saline wetland that doesn't emit uh, nitrous oxide and, in fact, is a sink for nitrous oxide and a sink for carbon dioxide. So we've got um, a few case studies that we're uh, currently undertaking uh, to sort of uh, shore up the science around these ideas of re-wetting the landscape with seawater in order to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Probably one of the other opportunities I want to um, talk about is uh, the, the drainage of the landscape. All right, so this sort of speaks to this uh, sugarcane example. And uh, this is a paper that was out recently, but basically it documents the drainage of uh, Queensland for sugarcane production. And in fact, there's about 40,000 kilometres of drains in North Queensland that do this job. And, if, and this is a picture of a map of the drains that you can see if you sort of get onto the Queensland globe uh, to have a look at it. So why I bring this up is not that I'm expecting the Babinda swamp to turn into a mangrove, but actually this um, drains are really potent uh, emitters of greenhouse gas. And they basically are what's you know, driving a lot of that. Well, this is how water of poor quality enters the, uh, the intertidal zone. And these drains are also, they drain the landscape, but they are going to be a, a conduit for sea level rise as well. 
So I think this, this is something that we really need to think about in terms of planning for uh, climate change in the landscape and what opportunities might arise for restoration of coastal wetlands um, uh, through time. Okay, so this is like an early acknowledgement, but I wanna um, draw your attention to the partner that we have to do this kind of work, to think large scale about restoration of coastal wetlands. And that is the Queensland Government's new land restoration fund, which is a $500 million investment, right? And um, their goal is to fund projects that sequester carbon, boost revenue for farmers and landholders, which we may be able to do with carbon farming, deliver benefits, especially for traditional owners. And I think blue carbon gives us another vehicle to interact with traditional owners, enhance wetlands for fisheries, strengthen critical habitat protect protection and restore ecosystems and degraded lands. So these are our partners in this. So just to finish up, uh, challenges and a uh, few conclusions. What we're up to is case studies. We're interested whether reintroduction of tidal flows is going to work the way we think it's going to do uh, for greenhouse gas mitigation. We're going to start to plan some projects where the blue carbon benefits are high, the alternative incomes are low. So, uh, you know, sugarcane is not working, the ponded pastures are not delivering very big benefits, and where there's high benefits for water quality and biodiversity and adaptation to climate change. And we're looking to develop methodologies that are both robust and cost effective in order to uh, use them ourselves in Australia, Queensland and Australia, but also uh, internationally. So with that, that's my acknowledgements. Thank you.